All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, my name is James Grant. I'm the customer success manager here at iMeasureU. For those of you who don't know what iMeasureU is, we are a lower limb load monitoring solution to help with your return to play um, and general load monitoring needs. Um, so just a few bits of housekeeping before I hand it over to Clint. Um, number one, if you have any questions, we will have a question and answer portion at the end. Um, so in the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q&A box. Um, just throughout the presentation, when a thing pops up, write, write it in there and we'll select your questions at the end um, to have Clint answer live. Um, the recording will be sent to you afterwards. So if you need to leave for any reason, don't worry, we'll, we'll be sending the link uh, after the meeting has been processed tomorrow. Um, and we do have a recent release which allows you to um, play in the sandbox and um, create your own account with iMeasureU. So you'll be re redirected to that at the end if you have any interest in exploring those metrics. Um, so let me introduce to you Clint Hansen. Uh, Clint is currently a researcher and the deputy head of research at Christian Albrechts University in Kiel, Germany. Uh, he's previously worked at Aspatar Qatar and, as a researcher and ACL coordinator. His research and clinical practice is focused on understanding and characterizing the biomechanics of human movement with his most current projects involving the development of digital outcome measures that could serve as objective clinical endpoints. Uh, Clint's extensive experience in clinical movement analysis has been facilitated through the widespread use of 3D motion capture, musculoskeletal modeling, and wearable technologies, including EMG, GPS, and IMU. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Clint um, and let him take it away. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Sounds that I know a lot, apparently. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a bit today about IMUs. And uh, I'm currently located in Kiel, as you can see, a very nice city in, at the Baltic Sea. Uh, not always nice weather, I have to admit, which unfortunately is where I'm located at the moment. But I'm not actually head of research. I'm deputy head of research of the neurogeriatrics group in Kiel. And as was pointed out already, we are mainly focusing on neurogeriatric patients with the use of mobile technology, but also 3D motion capture. So in case you have any questions that you're not wanting to share in the Q&A box down there, then uh, just send me over an email. My email address is up there or via Twitter. You can find me and just shoot me an email or a message and I'll try to get back to you ASAP. So I have no, let me just remove this one. This one no. so, okay. so I have no actual conflict of interest at all. Not to any kind of regards. Am I affiliated with iMeasureU or any other kind of device? distributor or manufacturer. And uh, just as a reminder, because I think that's very important as well, is that um, webinars are supposed to be fun, voluntary and free. So whatever you have to say, keep it friendly, as will we. So the general agenda is relatively straightforward. I want to talk about general motion capture and how I see it and what I think is important to distinguish. And then what many of you guys may perceive as the real work with IMUs, and then we can see if that actually aligns with what I think or with the plenum things. And then also we are going to look into IMUs in a bit more detail and we have a look at the specifications. And then afterwards we sum it up a bit with uh, some sensor findings and applications that are used in general. So for me personally, movement is a biomarker because movement itself tells us a lot about the status of our musculoskeletal system. A very stupid idea is if I kick someone of you guys on the shin, I can see that the person is limping. So just having the person limping gives me a very, very good idea about the status of the person, so of the health status. That means also that if we see someone on the pitch running and he or she has a hamstring injury, we can see that immediately the person slows down, is in agony, probably falls. So just based on the movement what we can see, that we can see, we have a pretty good understanding of how the person feels, behaves and performs. 
So I think this is, that sets a bit the stage of what movement is and why movement is so important for all of us. So in terms of movement analysis, it's very important to understand that we can have a look at movement analysis from multiple levels. So we can be very, very granular when we are just looking at the foot, at the foot biomechanics, for example, or we can go a bit up the chain and we look at specific segments. So there we could look at the leg in general during sprinting, running, or during just football playing. But also we can look at it from a more global level. What does that mean? That means, for example, if we are looking at the running style or the gait of a person, it's the same example as before. We get a really good understanding of how the person behaves and how the person actually handles everyday tasks. For example, we can see that our grandfather does not move the same as we do, or in general, the elderly, they move quite different, and the same goes obviously for high performance athletes. So depending on the level that we want to look at, we can look at local, segmental, or the global level. And if we combine all those approaches, then we can come up with very, very complex and comprehensive biomechanical uh, models that will allow us to dig deeper into the motor control of people. This is something that uh, Rula is doing. Rula is also, I think, in this webinar, and I suggest she should give a webinar the next time because that's very interesting what she's doing. So why is movement analysis so important? Well, it's basically everywhere. Unfortunately, this year, the Olympics are not going to happen, but um, next year, hopefully, what we can see is that there will be a live feed of the performance values of the athletes live. So there are artificial intelligence models that will allow us to understand the performance immediately while it happens. And basically what's stats driven. If we look at baseball, we want to know how good a pitcher is. We want to know how many throws the person has done. We also want to understand a bit better of the performance in any other sport. So for example, how fast was Usain Bolt actually the last time he ran? Or how far is someone jumping? Those stats are gathered just by movement analysis systems, no matter how they are. So, but what are we doing in the clinics on the daily practice? Well, we have, I would say, three pretty good or bad, depending on the object, um, good tools at hand. So once we have the clinical expertise, so we know the doctor and the doctor will eventually tell us if the player is good to go or if the player has some issues. Then we have the experience of the coach and the physiotherapist and what I like to call the iometer. The iometer is something that it's terribly subjective, not objective at all. And everyone has a different opinion on the performance of an athlete, for example, or on the behavior of an athlete. So I would say that is something that we can't really trust too much. And then obviously we have classic tools like the simple good old um, stopwatch. But we can obviously go a bit deeper and a bit more technical. And this is where the instrumented movement analysis comes in handy. But there we have to distinguish between two very broad um, system or ideo ideologies. So either we go for 3D motion capture system that allows us to get information about the position in space. So basically we have a camera system that will then allow us to extract information from small markers that you may have seen, for example, in the development of movies or games. And what we can get then is we can conduct clinical gait analysis and get a really good understanding about the movement of a person and can quantify it with a very, very high precision. However, the problem with those systems is with 3D motion capture is that we are bound to one location. We can only do specific tasks and most of the time the laboratories are relatively small so we cannot go really into sport specific things. The whole analysis and the data collection is very, very time consuming. The costs that are involved are very, very high and quite often we talk about a quarter of a million US dollars. 
And what we also need, and that is the most important part, in my opinion, is trained expert personnel. So we need people that actually know what they're doing because there are so many pitfalls, but the same goes obviously for IMUs. So inertial measurement units, on the other hand, they don't give us any kind of information about position per se. What they give us is information about the orient orientation in space. And those systems that are just shown here, they just allow you to, um, depending on what kind of systems we are looking at, they allow you to do clinical gait analysis as well, either with one sensor or multiple sensors, or they can be used for load monitoring for return to play decisions. The, ma the main advantage for those of those IMUs is basically that they are relatively low in price, depending obviously what you're choosing. But then also you can examine patients and subjects not only in the clinic, but also in home environments or in environments that are closer to reality, for example, the pitch. You also need trained personnel, or at least personnel that understands what they are doing, because just throwing up a sensor does not really help. So having said that, I think this is exactly what we think most of the time. In an ideal world, when we hear IMUs, yeah, great, sounds perfect, let's put them on our athlete. The athlete performs, and we get fancy, nice little results out of it. Let me just laser point here. So we get any kind of different nice parameters that the system that we chose spits out. Fantastic, but that's the theory. Obviously, we have a lot of friends and good colleagues that know exactly how to use them. And this is also, this is great to see, for example, Daniel Greenwood from Memphis, who gave the webinar the other week, who showed very, very nicely that a person who is, uh, who is recovering from foot injury from week nine to week 11 has a huge decrease in the symmetry and in the load distribution. So I've highlighted that here. So in week nine, the person was not yet ready to play and we can see that there were huge symmetries when we are looking at left and right. In week 10 already, this has been decreased. And then at week 11, we are looking at almost no difference between left and right, which is exactly what we want. And this is a very great, it's a great example, but it's an example of someone who really knows his stuff and has done IMU measurements for a long time. The same goes out, uh, or the same happens actually in Aspitar in Qatar, where Vasilis is using another system that allows you, it's an IMU based system that allows you also to measure joint angles. And those joint angles can then be used in ACL rehab to understand if a person who suffered from ACL rehab actually goes back to normal and is then allowed to go back on the pitch. In this example, there was um, a squat example. And what we can see down here are the sagittal plane angles for uh, the ankle. In red, we have the knee. And then in orange, we have the hip. And what we can see that after a certain period of time, our player is back to the same kind of performance with the involved as with the uninvolved leg. So if I move the player here, and also what we can see that the peak knee flexion is actually back to where it was before. So depending on who we talk to, we get very nice results with IMUs. But this is, in my opinion, a very, very complicated situation because do we really understand and know what an IMU is? Well, first of all, we need to go a step back. And now it's getting a bit more technical, but uh, stay with me, I try to keep it fun. Um, so what is an inertial measurement unit? An inertial measurement unit is nothing else but a microelectromechanical -electro system. What does it mean? Well, it means it's a small device with a bunch of different sensors inside. So the most famous and the most renowned, I would say, is an accelerometer. And an accelerometer is a small chip, basically, or a device that allows you to detect changes in speed. So having said that, that's the biggest thing that we are talking about today. Then usually there's also a gyroscope involved. 
and the gyroscope detects the changes in the orientation. So it does not allow you to get an angle, but it gives you the angular velocity. And then usually there's also a magnetometer um, built in those systems that allows you to measure the magnetic field. So this is just so that you've heard it once. Now we are coming back to the accelerometer stuff later. And then that is very important that each of those sensors is important, but does not allow us to get the whole picture. And only the combination of the sensors will then allow us eventually to get the orientation of the sensor in space. So what I want to do now with you guys is just to give you an understanding of how raw data looks like. And what we're doing is we're using my mobile phone for that. Don't worry, I'm not putting it too close to the camera. We're trying to have a live demonstration. So keep those axes in mind. So accelerations, maybe just to explain linear accelerations, we have an acceleration in three dimensions. So in each of the sensors that we are talking about and also in your mobile phone, you have a 3D accelerometer. So you measure accelerations in Y, X, and in Z direction. So let's hope that everything works. And it should, you should now see a completely different screen. I'm sorry for the German. Um, but by the way, have a look at Firefox. It's a German university who has built this thing and it's a really nice tool because it allows you to display and understand everything that's basically inside of your mobile phone. So I have my mobile phone now in my hand. I have to move a bit. Those people here again. And now I just click go. And you can see on the screen that there's an acceleration in X, Y, and in Z. So in this case, it is uh, the acceleration is measured in meter second square. So let's just try to move it into one direction. So I move it into the screen. So now we can see that the X shows up certain uh, parameters. So in our case, it's the acceleration in your direction and backwards. And that goes for all the other directions. So now we can have a look at the Y direction and obviously in the Z direction. So we could do the same thing for, uh, we could do the same thing for every other sensor that is in the mobile phone. But basically, this is what is built in in your sensor, whichever sensor you're using. So now you should see my screen again. So, and today we're talking mainly about accelerations and about the accelerometer. So keep in mind that the unit that we're talking about is either G, which is just gravity, and it's 9.81 meters per second square, about, just for the figures that, are, that I'm going to show afterwards. So now the question is, what are we actually making out of those accelerations that uh, companies, no matter which company, is showing us? So how can we get from the raw data to something that is really meaningful? And I don't want to say, I don't want to give you suggestions what is meaningful because that really depends on the application that you're looking for. So the next thing that I would like to do now is to ask very dramatically, maybe even, um, are sensors interchangeable and will all the sensors give us the same results? Well, that's a good question um, because yes and no. Most of the, oh, is there something for me? Chat? Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so, let me go back. Okay. So, are they, are they measuring exactly the same? Well, yes and no. Because, just because some kind of manufacturer has a very fancy dashboard or a results section, does not mean necessarily that the other sensors could not provide the same kind of thing. But in order to understand a bit better what we really need for our application, we need to have a look at 
the sensor specifications. Again, we're just looking at the accelerations. So today I just thought, how much is actually an accelerometer? And you can buy accelerometers for 30 cents. So you can also buy on, on Spark Fund, for example, you can buy small little things that for nine bucks or for 15 bucks that will allow you to read out accelerations. So but the question is, why do we need then other sensors? Well, because the specification of our sensors are very important. So for example, if we look at the ranges of our sensors, then we need to understand that high frequencies are sometimes needed and very large acceler ranges as well. So in this case, we have plus minus 200 G, which is 200 times gravity. And we can get data with up to 1,600 Hertz. So Hertz again is frames per second. That means we have 1,600 1, data points per second. So why is that important? Well, it's important for multiple reasons. So if you have someone running, for example, and you want to get a good understanding of the behavior of the foot strike pattern of the loading, and we measure something with a relatively low frequency, then we have an issue because the issue will be that we lose some kind of information compared to a higher frequency. This is not a real life example. This is just an example to make you understand that a high frequency is sometimes needed in order to get some kind of information. So if we're looking at a sport specific, um, at a sport specific example, then I would go for running because running is a relatively fast um, movement. And if we sample now, it's the same run, but I've down sampled our, um, the original data set that was captured with 500 Hertz in our lab. So we have here the vertical acceleration and it's meter per second square again. So now we can see that we get actually a reduction in the information that we have for the same heel strike basically, depending if we're measuring with 500 or even 50 Hertz. So there's a huge difference, but what does that actually mean for us? Well, it means that we need to choose our sampling frequency accordingly. But when we choose our sampling frequency accordingly, we need to understand also that if we have a lot of data points, we need a lot of storage and we need a lot of battery in order to keep everything well and running. So that was the frequency. And another big point is ranges. So the sensor range. Because what we don't want when we're measuring accelerations, for example, if you remember the uh, kicking example that was shown in the video, the guy kicked the ball and there was a result flashing in 175 G. Wow, impressive. But the problem is, if my accelerometer does not allow me to measure 175 G, then it will saturate and we just get the maximum that the sensor is capable of spitting out. So we are going into the same example again that I was showing before. So now we are looking at 500 Hertz running data. We can see the sensor is located on the foot so we can clearly identify all the events that we are really interested in. But this time what we're doing, we are clipping the signal. So artificially I removed the ranges that we are mainly interested in. So the very high ranges here, so this is the full range up to 100, let's put 70 uh, meters second square. So now if we clip at 10 G, what happens? Well, we only get data until 100 meters per second square. And if we go even further and look at 5 G, well, the information is very limited. So now imagine you're measuring someone running or you want to measure some, someone who's running with a low frequency accelerometer with very low uh, ranges. Well, you can imagine that you're not getting exactly the same information as someone who's running with an IMU that has a high sampling frequency and a very high um, range. So also something that I think is very, very important, especially for people who are using 
uh, GPS sensors, for example, on the lower back or even on the higher back. Um, what you need to understand that you have a propagation of the impact. So basically what that means is that the lower you are on your body, the higher will be the impact forces. This is why most of the time when you're looking into load, you're having an IMU or an accelerometer that is located on the foot. So now a nice example from the French group around uh, four showed that if you're looking always at the vertical acceleration of the signal, so always upwards, um, what we can see is that the acceleration on the third metatarsal bone level was relatively high and reduces the higher we go up the chain. So here it's up to 10 G maybe, over here it's up to seven or eight. When we're looking at the femur or the knee level more or less, then we get only 5G maybe, and if we're looking at the greater trochanter, well, then it's even lower. So another example of the same data set that I showed before is, again, 500 hertz sampling rate, and now we are looking at the same run, but this time we have three IMUs, or three accelerometers on the person, and we can see clearly that there's also a lot of different signals that we get. If we have an accelerometer on the lower, or on the lower limbs on the foot level, we get very high accelerations in the vertical direction, not so high accelerations on the lower back, and the signal completely looks different when we're having an IMU or an accelerometer on the arm. So again, different kind of uh, ideas depending on what we are looking for. So then, I love this example because this is when uh, Dan and I get really into a lot of discussion. What can we actually measure with sensors? So we are working with neurogeriatric patients and now we are looking at someone who is walking and has a disease. So it's an old person and the person walks. So what you can see already is that in terms of acceleration, we're never going to get 200 or high ranges. So we get maximum maybe 60 meters per second square. And this is on the foot. But if we look now at the lower back and we wanted to get some information from the lower back sensor, well, that's quite complicated because the acceleration is so low because the person is maybe shuffling or the person is just walking very, very strangely or just behaving like a very old person. So, but I think it's important for every one of us now that we discussed a bit about the sensor specifications and that kind of stuff that we are going a bit further and now we're looking at some parameters that we can extract from the data that we are collecting on a daily basis. And I call it demystification, but in reality it's just explaining how we can make sense of our sensors. So as I said before, so if we're looking at the sensor data, sorry, and we just extract the data from our sensors, we will get a terrible large Excel spreadsheet with values. And then we will have values from our accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, whatever we have measured. But this is actually how it will look like. So a bunch of data, what are we doing with it? Well, what we can do with it, first of all, we can visualize the sensor data and that is the data that I was, um, it's again running data, but it just gives you a good idea of the different um, um, of the different directions of the sensor, for example. And then what most people usually want to look at, and this is how also player load sometimes is uh, measured, is if they're using the signal magnitude area. So basically, is those three signals in X, Y, and Z direction combined? And why is this important? Because sometimes we not only have a very clear idea where the vertical direction is. So then we are combining our signal and when we combine our signal, then what we can do is we can identify steps or strides. Whenever our heel touches the ground, we will have a high impact, but depending on the sensor orientation, if it is my foot, depending on the sensor orientation, it's not always the vertical that we can take. So what we need to do, we need to use maybe the signal magnitude in order to detect when a heel strike or initial contact occurs. 
And now what I want to do with you guys is just to make you understand what we can do if we have already detected a heel strike. So I'm not going really into the heel strike detection, but this is just to show you from the same data set before. It's relatively clear when the foot hits the ground. And to make it a little more easy for us, we say always the peaks are the ones that we are looking for. So now what can we do when we have the peaks identified? Well, if we have the peaks identified, then it's relatively easy to say we have this amount of steps and then we can calculate cadence, for example. We can calculate the runtime because that is something that we can see from the first to the last, um, from the first to the last uh, step. And then we can go even further. So now that we have identified heel strikes, what we can do is we can identify the delta t, so the delta time in between two heel strikes. And if we have that, then we get already some kind of temporal parameters that allow us to, uh, to describe running, for example. So we know that someone has a certain, and for example, in sprinting, there will be very, very short steps and then there will be longer steps from a temporal point of view. And then when we are looking into the spatial parameters, we can also calculate, for example, um, step length or stride length if we are integrating some of our other sensors that are usually inside of an IMU. But also what we can do then is we can um, distinguish between the stance phase and the swing phase. And then we can give another, we get another idea of how a person has maybe a longer stance phase once they fatigue. So those are things that we can relatively easily extract from our raw data. And this is exactly what people are usually doing. So if we look now at the running example again, and then maybe a dashboard that you are familiar with from uh, I measure you, um, I'm not, it's probably not exactly what they are doing, but this is just to give an overview of how things are probably done and what you can get out of the raw data. So once we have identified the heel strike or the impact, we know exactly where the impact is. It's a bit over 150 meters square, so that is round about 15 G. So then what we can say is, okay, this one here goes into this little bin because it was our left running foot. And if we are running for a certain period of time at this speed, then we get a quite nice distribution of how we were running. And then we can see asymmetries or, prob or problems that we may have because we are just hitting the ground too hard. And then we are not more in the medium area here, but we are in a different area. So now that I've bored you quite a bit with the technicalities, now let's just have a look at several applications. So some of the applications are quite interesting and I find fascinating. I have no idea how they're actually using it, but just to give you a broad overview before we then sum up and come back to the questions that you hopefully have. So the first question is, where do you want to measure and what do you want to measure? And now I just go through couple or a few examples. So walking, well, clinical gait analysis is a very big thing and using IMUs for that has been shown to be very, very efficient, either with the use of one IMU on the lower back on the feet, where we can extract parameters, both spatial and temporal parameters to get a better understanding if someone has become better during rehabilitation or not. Or if we're using a different system, in this case, it's the Norikson system, where we have multiple IMUs and we can also generate joint kinematics. So we get a really good understanding of how the motion happened. Uh, for example, in this case, the person's running. And then what we can do with some of those devices, we can then create a little avatar of ourselves and understand better how the person is actually running. So, but then also obviously for uh, load measurement, and that is, uh, for example, uh, the I measure U, the IMU step, I think it is. 
And in here, what we have is two different IMUs that are located on the lower, well, on the ankles, basically. And then we can not only count the steps, but also bin them in a certain area and calculate bone load or any other parameter that uh, is then spit out. So this is for load monitoring, a very valuable tool as I've shown before. Then another tool that is very interesting in terms of jumping. So running is not jumping necessarily, we could argue. And uh, this is an app or this is uh, the Vert app. And this can be used to identify, not only identify jumps, but also give you some metrics about jump height and um, different kind of percentages and also some inclination angles based on an IMU that is put on the lower back. And now a nice tool that we've worked with the, the national handball team in Qatar was we wanted to monitor how many throws they're actually doing during a, a game or during practice. And basically it's a little IMU that you can stick here and then it measures not only the angular velocity, but also it counts how many um, throws the person has, do, has been doing throughout the training uh, session or the game. And those kind of parameters can be extracted from the accelerations. Um, but why is this important? Well, it's important because in some leagues, it's, there are limits to how many pitches people are allowed to do per day in baseball, at least. I was not aware of that, but Rod Whitley from uh, Qatar is a very big baseball fan and he explained the whole thing to me, which I tried to forget immediately afterwards. Um, and then swimming. I've not come across this application before, so I just thought it was interesting to see. So nowadays they're using also IMUs to identify strokes, get uh, into the performance analysis of swimming, identify how many strokes do you need, for example, for 100 meters, and if your accelerations are relatively bad once you're in the water so that you're not wasting your energy by that, basically. So bear with me, we are almost there. Um, maybe now the six simple, simple steps maybe for us to, to go through. So how do we get started with IMUs? And if you have, if you've started already, perfectly fine. But it's just something that I like to remind myself of every now and then. So what is the application that you want to measure? Do you know that? Can you describe it also to someone who is not familiar with the movement? And then the next question is almost as important is, what is the technology that you want to use? Do you need to have an IMU? Do you maybe need a camera system? Do you need something else? And then the third one is the time management. How long does the measurement take you? And can, do you think that you can manage not only to take the measurement, but also to provide then the results to everyone else? And then the fourth part is probably, in my opinion and experience, is the most important one is, what do you explain to your athletes or to, to your coaches or to anyone who is involved? How difficult is it, A, to create the report? How easy is it to read? And how easy is it to understand for all of you guys? And if you have a satisfactory answer to all of those points, then great, you found the solution and you know exactly which system you want to use and you know exactly where we go from here. So in summary, in summary I think, what we need to do first, we need to understand the problem that we want to tackle with technology. Once we have understood that, then we can choose our system. And if we have chosen our system, then we can master the data and create reports. And once we have created those reports, we have to feed them back, not only to the athletes or the patients, but also to all the other staff that is involved. And if we have done that, perfect but we also need to adapt continuously because there may be players that need something else or they need there's a new medical doctor coming in who needs some other information and this this little chart here just shows you the complexity of data acquisition and analysis 
in the supervised assessment. I stress the word supervised because supervised is everything that we are basically doing. We are having our patients running or athletes running. We know exactly what they are doing and when they are doing it. So in this case, if we want to understand what they're doing and we want to track the activity, we choose one system or one sensor. If we are looking into asymmetries or load, then we can use, for example, two. If we're really interested in the movement analysis, including joint angles or whatever, then we need more sensors. But depending on in which direction we go, we also need to understand the system specifications and they need to be adapted accordingly. And I stress the point supervised because this morning I went to the market with my wife and I put an IMU on my foot and this is clearly an unsupervised environment. So what that means is that I set it up this morning on my shoe, let it sit outside, had coffee, and then we walked downstairs, uh, we crossed two roads and we had to wait at a traffic light. And over here, what I did, I ordered something at one of those little stalls. Then we walked around on the market and then afterwards I leave, get stuck again in traffic, but then I walk again. And just this little example shows you how different our behavior also is in the unsupervised environment when we are just walking. So if you can see the differences in the accelerations from me walking or marching to work with being at ease with my wife on the market. And with that, I thank you for listening to my gibberish and uh, hope you have a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clint. Um, yeah, we do have a few questions from the group. Uh, the first one is, can you estimate force, say of a soccer kick from the measures from an IMU? So I should say that again. Can you estimate force from the measures of an IMU? Um, well, based on F equals the mass times the acceleration, you could, but uh, you need to have a very detailed understanding of the segment weight, I would say, of the person. So, yeah, I think I've, I've read up on it a bit, but um, it's a very rough estimation, I would say, but um, not sure if that's something that you really want to do. But theoretically, it's, you can, but I'm not really sure what kind of information that would give you, but happy to discuss further. Great. Um, another anonymous question um, says, thanks for the presentation. Where do you see IMU applications being used in five to 10 years in the future? Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a good one. And now I'm just talking what I would like to see. Um, so first of all, I think that the batteries are getting better, that the sensors are getting smaller, so we can virtually put them everywhere. But also I think the main driver at the moment is that we want to get a complete picture of our athletes. So that means that we want to measure them with a 3D motion capture system because the precision is unheard of. Um, but then the next thing is that I think we can combine those two approaches to have a hybrid system. What does that mean? That means that we are doing, for example, a static calibration in, um, in the laboratory. We put also some kind of markers on there and then the static calibration is done. We have IMUs also involved in the whole system. We remove the markers, we have the person run on the pitch. And then after the session, the person comes back in, does a second calibration kind of, and then we can get all the parameters that we could not get before with so many sensors. We can interpolate them based on the calibration. So I think hybrid systems is the next really big hot topic. Okay. Um, so are you able to determine distance from IMUs? This question from Hugo. Yeah, yeah, you can. Depending on where you put the IMU, you can get there. So if you're putting the IMU on the lower back, then what you will have to do, you have to create a inverse pendulum model. So basically like this, and then 
what happens is that you can, based on the height differences that you can measure based on the acceleration velocity and then the distance, so if you integrate it and get a good understanding of what's going on, um, then you can estimate step length and based on the step length or stride length, then you can uh, get distances. And, but that only works with IMUs, not necessarily with the uh, accelerometers because you need to get a good understanding of, uh, of the um, orientation of the sensor. So yes, it's possible, but you have to think very hard in where you put the sensors, but there are solutions out there. Okay, following up uh, with the lower back, um, during load monitoring, activity monitoring, with an accelerometer that's placed on the lower back, in terms of 3D propagation of impact, should placement be different depending on a particular injury? For example, an ankle versus a quad injury? Um, no, not necessarily. If you're always using a lower, the sensor on the lower limb, that's fine because it's, kind of where the whole torso is. So I think that makes a lot of sense to, if you want to collect load or prior load or whatever you want to call it really, the signal magnitude basically. We usually, usually we use it on the lower back because it's more reliable than if you would just put it on the ankle or the arm or whatever. So if you wanted to get the signal magnitude, for example, and like the activity, patterns throughout the day, then I would use it on the lower back, yes. Okay, have you ever done any IMU collections over long periods of time, for example, four plus hours, and what complications are there to longer data collections with IMUs? So we are doing, and it's not bragging, it's just because we set ourselves on fire, is we do data collection for seven days and even more continuously. So that means we have a sensor that the person is putting on the lower back and then the person is uh, sleeping with it as well and they just remove it for showering, for example. Um, the problem is what are the people doing and what do you really want to know? So, and then also that's the first part and then the second part is from a sensor level is uh, a drift. Well, what happens quite often is uh, that if you have a gyro that you see, that the sensor is lying on the floor like this or on the table. But if you look at the data, it happens that the sensor is actually moving a bit. And that, that is a natural sensor drift that exists in all IMUs. And it's just afterwards that it can be recalibrated basically. And you have to remove the drift. So that is a big issue. And um, our main issue, and that's quite a costly one, is if people go to the toilet and the sensor falls in the toilet. But I think that is not what everyone will experience. But uh, yeah, it, it's very exciting, but you need to understand what the people are doing. So for example, if you're running a marathon, for example, yeah, well, just run a marathon and you know exactly what you're doing. And then you can actually collect, um, get the parameters, whatever you want to calculate out of that. So that's not an issue. Just choose the right sensor for that. Okay, great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so Thomas asked, um, he says you showed a detection of a foot strike based off of an acceleration spike. How reliable is that detection method and do you know if it extends well to real world walking? So in this example, it was just because I was lazy. Um, but depending on where you put the sensor, it will give you a very, very good idea when the heel strike actually occurs. So what we do, for example, in our cohorts, we validate all our heel strike estimations against a gold standard. In our case, it's 3D optical motion capture system. And based on the foot, it's relatively easy to do that. And um, if you go up the chain and you use the lower back, that's also relatively clear to identify when the step actually occurs. So I'm not, I can't, I, I cannot tell you like how many milliseconds we are good at, but uh, if, if you're really interested in it, then um, I'm pretty sure I can get your email or you get mine and then we can have a chat because that's our bread and butter with our neurological patients over here.
Okay, and this is a um, follow up to the drift question. Do you have any good resources for drift correction and calibration correction routines? Um, yeah, but again, also depends on what kind of sensor you have. So if the sensor and the quality of the raw data is not ideal, let's put it this way, and it's never ideal, um, then all your drift corrections can only be that good. But uh, yeah, we have pretty good ideas. So you can either filter the data or you detrend it. So there are multiple things that you can do, especially if you detect over time certain periods where you can be certain that, I don't know, the foot was on the floor. That's usually done in order to get step length. What you do is you're looking for a window where there's no movement and that is then your static um, period. And that can then be used to get a zero velocity update in order, sorry for that, forget it. Once the foot is on the floor, then you set your sensors to zero, you know exactly it's on the floor and then you have the next step and then you can reduce the drift time basically. So, but again, happy to discuss that offline because it's a whole different topic again. Okay, yeah, and just a reminder to the attendees, um, Clint's email is at the bottom of this slide right now. So if you wanna reach out to him directly, I will also be sending an email tomorrow with the recording. So if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reply to that and I can get you in touch with Clint as well. Um, so we have time for a few more questions. Uh, Clint, another one is um, from an anonymous question. Can we quantify the distance between two IMUs attached on both feet? No. <laughs> no. If we don't have any assumptions before and after then no so what, what we could do is probably we could get uh, the distance if we know that the people for example in the clinics what we do is uh, we do a timed up and go so we our patients are sitting they're standing up walking turning coming back sitting again so during the walk for example just before they start turning if we know exactly the distance between the two feet before, like at the beginning of the recording at the end, then we can get a really rough estimation, but it's not ideal. So I would say no, but uh, I'm more than happy to be convinced otherwise, because we're working on it, it's a really difficult topic. Okay. Um, would you be able to use the IMUs for ice skating? And if so, how? Um, yeah, we last last semester, Stefan Kratzenstein, I think he's in here as well, who's the lab of uh, the lab leader of the Cow Motion Lab. Um, he and I we did a, a project with uh, some students, and they were using IMUs and accelerometers on during skating, but not ice skating, but during skating on the um, outside. I don't know the term is for. Um, and yeah, well, obviously you can estimate the accelerations that occur. Obviously, if you wanted to calculate something like player load, it goes completely off because it's a complete different movement and player load is mainly driven by the vertical acceleration. So, and you don't have that too much. So, um, <clears throat> I think you can identify quite some interesting parts, but just out of the top of my head, because they wanted to, understand the differences between running and skating and obviously one is with skates and one is with shoes but the movement is so different that obviously they found differences but thinking out loud i think you could probably get a really good understanding of what the person is doing if you integrate other sensors than the accelerometer and depending where you put the sensor as well so yes feasible but then again, what do you need? Okay, great. Thanks, Clint. Um, so that's probably all the time we have um, for now. So Clint, on behalf of I Measure You, thank you for the uh, great presentation. Um, for those attending, a reminder, you will be sent the recording um, tomorrow. And we have also enabled the ability for you to play around with the um, I Measure You data. So you'll be re redirected to that page when you log out. Um, but again, Clint, Clint's email is on this slide and you can also respond to me at any time um, with that email and I can, we'll be happy to put you in touch. 
Um, so thanks to everyone for attending and have a great day. Thanks guys.